with plenty of mistakes, a few embarrassing moments, and a handful of complete failures. I believe God not only loves me, but God wants me to love myself. How do we do that? How do we do that without coming off as arrogant? How do we remain humble while loving ourselves as Jesus commanded? Today, we will explore a love of self, a love of neighbor that might just appear to be a bit foolish to some, even careless. But I believe there is something else going on. Let us come together in worship and listen for God's living word. Let us pray. What does it mean to deeply root our lives in your love, O Lord? What does it mean to drink from the well of your merciful kindness? What does it mean for us to know your love and to truly believe we are loved? For far too many of us, we have allowed past experiences, the the opinions of others, or a, a struggle within our own self-worth to leave us questioning whether or not we are worthy of anyone's love. In our weaker moments, we can become pretty well convinced of our failure to meet the threshold of deserving love. Forgive us, Lord God, when we do not believe the words and, and living testimony of Jesus. Forgive us, and then help us to embrace our value as a beloved member of your family. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm a member of Cypress Creek Christian Church, and I'm part of what the church calls the priesthood of all believers. For that reason, I can say to all of you, your sins are forgiven. Grace and peace, and welcome to Cypress Creek Christian Church, a community striving to put love first in all things. We have some happenings in the life of our congregation that I want to remind you of. First of all, this coming Saturday, we have a work day from 9 a.m. to noon. If you can only come for two hours, that's just fine. Have a number of things we need to do. We want to, well, clean up some of the dry stuff, the dead stuff that you probably have in your yard as well, to make the campus look a little nicer in preparation for Easter. We also have some power washing, some window cleaning, 
task for most anyone. So I hope you might be able to give a few hours next Saturday. In, in mentioning Easter, I hope you've already ex- let us know that you have interest in attending our first in-person worship service. Yes, Easter Sunday, April 4th, we plan to be in the centrum. It won't be finished yet, but it will be far enough along that we'll be able to gather in there for worship. Well, with the number of folks that have already said, yes, I'm interested, we're probably going to be doing two services, not only the sunrise service, but two other services, because we want people to feel comfortable, not only with their masks on, yes, masks will be required, but for folks to be able to spread out in the worship space. Hopefully by the end of this coming week, we will be able to give you more specifics about the times and then invite you to say, yes, I plan to come to this service or I plan to come to that service. And then finally, I want to let the elders know that we have a meeting at 2 o'clock today on Zoom. Hope to see you then. Well, throughout the season of Lent, we've been focusing our attention on the same passage of Scripture from John's Gospel, chapter 12. We've listened to it every week, and, and then we've drawn out a single verse to focus our attention. Let us hear that focus passage again. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Verily, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. If it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again.
is the way, the truth, the life. Love is the river that flows through. Love is the answer of opening you. And love is the place we will fly to. And love never fails you. Today we're going to focus back in on chapter 12, verse 25. Hear these words. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. May God's blessing be upon not only the reading of these words, but the receiving of these words, the, the living word. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this gathering, even though it happens online, even though it may not happen in the way we would like. We give you thanks that we can be drawn together around these words of Scripture, and most importantly, around your Spirit. It is in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. There's a pastor, her, her name is Janet, and she was talking about a guy that she knew who signed up to join a gym. He'd been talking about it for a while, but when he finally was ready, he, he did it all out. He went and got the new shoes, fancy workout clothes, a new gym bag, and been telling everybody at the office about his plans to join the gym. And then one day, he shows up at the office with his gym bag in hand and tells everybody, tonight's the night, my first night of going and working out. The next morning... He hobbled into the office and made it very clear that he was very pleased that he had only signed up for the 30-day trial membership because he was canceling it as soon as possible. People told me I would feel great if I just go work out. I do not feel great, he said. I don't even feel good. It's funny how there is stuff in life that's good for us but we'd rather not do it. And then there's stuff that we really enjoy doing that's not good for us. I think there's some other categories as well, and in fact, it is in one of those other categories that I think we find love. Not romantic love, but Jesus' love. That kind of love that, that we've been talking about throughout the season of Lent. We find it discussed indirectly in John's Gospel, the 12th chapter. And as we've drawn a verse each week, I think we've been able to think a little more deeply on, on how Jesus understood, and even more importantly, how he lived love. You may remember a few weeks ago, we, we read the words where Jesus declares that that the time is right, the time is at hand for the Son of Man, or sometimes translated the ideal human or the model human being, to be glorified. And then last week, we went a little deeper on that idea of glory, how we are to understand it. And I think how it's understood in John's Gospel is very different than how we think about glory. We tend to think about it as, you know, winning the game on the last play and standing in the spotlight and waving to the adoring fans. Yet when you look at Jesus, his time of glory begins with his arrest and ends with his crucifixion. He does not stand on a stage basking in the glow of his success and smiling to the, the crowd that applauds him. No, he hangs on a cross while the sky turns dark and while people ridicule him and scorn him. Glory, it's not so much in John's Gospel the arrest or the crucifixion, it's the why. Why was he arrested? Why was he crucified? It is there that we begin to understand what it's all about. The why is love. 
unconditional, unmerited, self-sacrificing love that stood as a radical alternative to many other people's understanding of love. But as we move to the verse that we're focusing on today, it's almost as if Jesus adjusts the focus. It had been on him for the first few verses that we've been reading through Lent, but now he focuses it on us. He moves the focus from the model human being to those of us who want to model our lives after him. He says those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. There's a word in there that causes me some some discomfort. Those who hate their life. Hate? Really? Now you need to understand, around our house, going back to when Zach was quite young, we had a rule. (laughs) You did not use the word hate. And not only because I don't really like the word, but, but it's also challenging for a young child to understand the difference between saying, I hate spinach and I hate Marcus or or whoever it might be. It's hard to explain to a four-year-old why it's okay to hate a certain vegetable, but not okay to hate a certain group of people. And maybe it's not just kids. Maybe we become all a little too careless and reckless with our use of the word hate. Yet Jesus seems to use it without reservation in this passage. The same Jesus who said, you've heard it said that you are to love your neighbor and hate your enemies, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. This is the same Jesus who says we are to love our neighbors, we love ourselves, which I think he is suggesting that we should love ourselves with the same kind of love that he demonstrated toward us. So which is it, love or hate? Are we to love ourselves or hate ourselves? Are we to love our lives or are we to hate our lives? Years ago, I heard Emmanuel Cleaver speak. At the time, he was the mayor of Kansas City, Missouri. Missouri. He's also a United Methodist minister. At that event, he was talking about how years earlier he had been involved in the civil rights movement and how at that time he was a part of a group of young people that were planning a sit-in. There had been other sit-ins that had ended with people being injured, beaten. And upon hearing that Emmanuel Cleaver was planning to participate in one of these sit-ins, one of his relatives said to him, Are you crazy? Do you really hate yourself? In the moment, Emmanuel Cleaver said he didn't even know how to respond to those words. But as he spoke to us that day, decades later, he said there are times when love might appear to be hateful towards self, but there's nothing further from the truth. It's interesting to me that Eugene Peterson, in his translation of the Bible called The Message, some of you may own that and use it. Uh, But I think his translation of this verse is, is helpful. He translates it this way. Anyone who holds on to life just as it is, destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. If you let it go, if you let your life go reckless in your love. I do not really believe that Jesus wants us to hate ourselves, and I think Peterson picks up on that idea. Yet I believe that the love Jesus preached, the love he demonstrated in his act of glorification from his arrest to his crucifixion, is in fact a love that is radical and reckless and and often gives the appearance of hating oneself. I can just imagine those who who watched Jesus throughout his ministry and then towards the end of his life when he was arrested and he was beaten and he was moved to to Golgotha to be crucified. I, I can just imagine people looking at him and saying, just tell him you didn't mean it. Recant. Throw your throw yourself on their mercy. Why is he he sticking to his convictions? Why does he want to remain faithful to this way? 
Does this guy hate his life? Twelve years ago, with a few of my ministry friends, we went to Italy, focusing mostly on Rome and, and the catacombs that are located in and around Rome. We wanted to go into the catacombs and, and look at some of the images, the ancient artwork that you find in the catacombs. Well, one of the places we went to visit were the catacombs of St. Agnes. And when we arrived, we were met by a nun who spoke wonderful English, and she immediately wanted us to learn the story of St. Agnes, one of the youngest martyrs in the history of Christianity. According to the nun, back in approximately the year 304, Agnes, who was probably about 13 years old at the time, a, a young girl who was part of a very wealthy family and was already, as she had many suitors, people who were trying to get her attention. And yet, you got to understand, Agnes declined all that interest because she had decided to give her heart, her life, fully to God. Well, one of those suitors, I, I'm only guessing that his ego had been bruised, turned her name into the powers that be, the Roman Empire, telling them that she was a Christian. And she was arrested, and according to the nun, she both expressed forgiveness and love towards the very person who turned her in. She was given the opportunity to recant her Christian beliefs, but she refused. And so she was to be burned at the stake. But according to the story, they could not get the, the wood to light. And so they killed her by the sword. And yet, as it was told, Agnes, in those last minutes of life, continued to express love towards the very people who would execute her. It was interesting, the nun telling us the story said, unlike so many other moments when, when a faithful person was martyred, and there would be this sudden rush of people wanting to join, to give their lives to God, to give their lives to Christ. That did not happen with St. Agnes. It was, as if, it was as if the people did not understand her expression of love. It was as if they stood back and said, how stupid can she be? That was what people thought when they looked upon her actions. How stupid can she be? How reckless can she be, giving the impression that she might hate her life? But there's nothing further from the truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul suggests that we are to be fools for the sake of Christ, or it can be translated fools with Christ. Well, when you read those words in the larger context of 1 Corinthians, I think Paul was trying to say that there are going to be times when we're going to be looked upon, where people are going to look at us and perceive something that is not correct. They are not going to understand the, the radical and reckless nature of love. And people will be left scratching their heads and asking, do these folks hate their lives? The answer is no. But it looks that way. Yet it's not just the great martyrs of the faith like St. Agnes. There are others. There was a couple that I got acquainted with uh, in the time when I was serving the church in Naples, Florida. They had visited a number of uh, winters for just two or three weeks. They had friends down there. And when they would visit Naples, they would usually come to our church one Sunday. But then the time came for them to retire and as they had been planning for quite some time, was to, to buy a house in Naples, to buy a house in the same neighborhood with two other couples that they had known who had already been living in Naples for a few years. Well, they retired, they bought the house, they settled in. They visited our church, they ended up joining another church, but we kept in contact, had coffee a number of times. But it was only a few months after they had moved in, settled in, that they got word that their daughter, who lived in Ohio, had been, had been diagnosed with an illness that had left her very sick and very weak to the point that she had to quit her job and she was no longer even able to care for their two children. And so this couple explained to me that they planned to immediately sell their house there in Naples, the one they had just purchased, and they were going to move 
back to Ohio and actually to the neighborhood where their daughter and her family lived so that they could help. The other two couples that lived in the neighborhood, lived in Naples for a while, were, were shocked by this choice. They couldn't believe that, they, oh, go, just go visit off and on and help out where you can. Maybe send them a little extra money to, so that they can get some more care. But the couple said, no. No, this is what we're going to do. And the last time I had coffee with them, they were really distraught because one of the other couples had really gotten angry with them. Suggesting that, you know, you, you've been working hard. You've been planning for this retirement. You, you shouldn't change it. And yet, they were not going to make a decision other than to sell their house and to move to Ohio. That was the plan. And though I, I don't know for sure, I can only guess that those other couples didn't understand this decision because they didn't recognize love being expressed in a challenging and difficult moment. And yet I believe that kind of love, the love that has been made real in Jesus, is the love that, that helps our own convictions, a love that we discover that is extended to us, and a love that helps us to, to love ourselves. And, and it's only then that we realize that we are capable of sharing that love. When we know how much love has been given to us and that we are called to love ourselves, then, then we can begin letting go, begin releasing that love into the world. Sometimes in some pretty crazy, radical, reckless ways that will leave other people wondering what's going on with us. Are, are you a fool? Do you hate your life? And yet what it is, is it's, it's love. The love that has been put on display in Jesus. Yet I think I, I think I need to warn you. Because when you do share that kind of love, when you share it in a, in a reckless kind of way, it will leave people kind of scratching their heads and wondering, do you hate your life? The answer is no. It's simply that People don't recognize love. They become too convinced that love is something else. But we see love put on display in the moment of, of Jesus' glorification, that time between his arrest and his crucifixion, where we see this unconditional, self-sacrificing love that will leave many people wondering, did he hate his life? No. He not only loved his life, he loved us. And he wanted us to understand the depth of that love. Join me in prayer. We give all praise and thanksgiving unto you, O glorious God. For in Jesus we have glimpsed your glory a whole different kind of glory, beautiful, awe-inspiring, life-changing glory. Today, as we worship, let us feel a, a discontent with how love has been defined and embodied so often in our world, something so very different than what we see in Jesus, especially from his arrest to his death. There we see a love that did not back down, a love that remained committed to your kingdom, values a loved that changed how we are to relate to our neighbor, our, our enemy, even those who seek to hurt us. May such a love be the model for us, and may the mission of putting love first in all things continue to be at work within us. We offer our words of prayer in the name of the model human being, Jesus Christ. Amen. More love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee. Hear thou the prayer I make on bended knee. This is my earnest plea, O love, O Christ, to thee, more love to thee, more love to thee. 
Most earthly joy I craved, sought peace and rest. Now thee alone I seek, give what is best. This all my prayer shall be, more love, O Christ, to thee, more love to thee, more love to thee. Then shall my latest breath whisper thy praise. This be the parting cry my heart shall raise. This still its prayer shall be, more love, O Christ, to thee, more love to thee, more love to thee. I find it so interesting that some people do not recognize love when it is put on display right in front of them. I mean, I, that's the only explanation I can come up with why Jesus was executed. They did not recognize love. What he was putting on display made him feel uncomfortable. The capacity of his love, the far-reaching character of his love, the unconditional nature of his love, it made them uncomfortable because what they were used to was a love that wasn't, in fact, love. Today, as we come to the table, let us be reminded of that meal that Jesus shared, a meal of love, often called the agape feast. The, the word agape is the Greek word that describes the unconditional love of God. Let us, in this meal, be reminded of how Jesus invited all to participate he did not set a boundary. He didn't have a list of rules. He didn't have certain hoops that people had to jump through. He simply extended an invitation through love. And even that has caused trouble within the church itself. People saying, yes, he loves us, but first, before somebody can come, before you are welcome here, before you cross that line and can receive the elements, you first have to do this, say that, think this way, believe this, pray this prayer. And that's not the Jesus I meet in Scripture. He just says, come. And however we show up, he's thrilled. Bring your whole life to this moment and know that you will be loved. Let's prepare for communion. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples. And at a time of his choosing, he took an ordinary loaf of bread, blessed it, and broke it, saying, This is my body broken for you. Eat of this in remembrance of me. In a like manner, he took the cup, saying, This is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for all sins. Drink of this cup as often as you eat of my body and do so until I come again. Let us pray. Our gracious God, as we partake of this bread and fruit, we thank you for the communion, which is a symbol of the spiritual union between you and us. We thank you for not only washing away our sins on the cross, but for welcoming us into the bond with you. God, you've given us so many tools to be the child of God you created us to be. You sent your beloved Jesus to redeem us, your Holy Spirit to empower us, and the scriptures to guide us. Fill us with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control so that we may be confident Christians. Now let us pray together the words he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The table is prepared. Now is the time for all of us to dine at a place where all are welcome. Gracious God, may your love and our lives come together in a life lived in love. May Jesus be our mentor and our model, and may the world see in us a life that is willing to put love first in all things. Amen.